Thank you. Oh, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the President and Fellows, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Society of Antiquaries of London. Uh, my name is John Cooper, and I'm the uh, Director of Research and Publications here. There we go. Um, the Director of the Society of Antiquaries uh, sounds like a very grand title. Uh, it's not quite the top job, for which at the moment I'm profoundly grateful. Um, I'm a Tudor historian. Um, a number of you in this room and online know me already. Um, in fact, so many of you know me that this feels a little bit like my retirement party or possibly my wake about 15 years early. The Society of Antiquaries is the senior scholarly society devoted to the study of the material remains of the past. We were founded in 1707, probably in a pub. We are now a fellowship of some 3,000 across the world. We have a royal charter. This is not the actual royal charter, but it does, I can quote from it. Um, since 1751, we are charged with the encouragement advancement and furtherance of the study and knowledge of the antiquities and history of this and other countries. I like the way that in 1751, they said this country and sort of other countries slightly grudgingly, I think, but certainly we have become um, a global fellowship today. And we've been here in Burlington House since 1874. Um, despite appearances, we operate not as a private club, but as a scholarly and educational charity. We award research grants. Uh, we care for and share our collections. We engage in research ourselves and we foster public knowledge of the material remains of the past. Those of you here in person, it is a particular pleasure to welcome you back into Burlington House. Um, for those of you online, please come and see us when you can. The Society of Antiquaries surveys, studies, and stands up for the past, but it is not stuck in it. Over the last couple of years, the society has done a lot to reform its governance, which is less easy if you have a royal charter, to open up its buildings and collections to researchers and to stage public events. A highlight for me was Mary's Hand, an operatic performance in this room by Macaulden Arts, to highlight queenship in 16th century England and our Eworth portrait of Mary, which those of you in the room, if you eyes right, um, then there she is. More recently, we had Lauren Mackay and Estelle Paronk discussing the political significance of the Berlin family in the context of a semi-dramatized TV series that Estelle and Lauren were advising on. We've also created two recent exhibitions, Blood Royal back in 2017, and the current exhibition, Henry VIII, Defender of the Faith? Question mark. That question mark, of course, is all important. Now, the second of those exhibitions is currently online, um, but those of you here in person will be able to go and see some of the objects uh, for yourselves up in the library at lunchtime. There are other ways in which the society is looking forward and needs to do so. Fellowships need to renew themselves or else they lose touch with emerging scholarly agenda. And that is what today is about. The position of early career researcher has probably never been more defined, but it is also precarious. Societies like ours need to work hard to engage with the next generation of scholars. I tried to find something under the next generation, which sounds terribly Star Trek, but you get, you get my point. Our funding for this is limited, but our expertise is vast and our facilities, at least for the moment here in Burlington House, are a fantastic asset. To those of you here in person and those watching online, I would say, please engage with us. Find out about our collections. Let us help you make scholarly connections. The average age of its elected fellows has crept up over the years. We want to check and indeed reverse that process. Um, the fellows of the future are likely to look like you, uh, may indeed be you. 
In my opinion, the antiquaries are uniquely placed to foster new strategies of studying and defending the cultural value of the past, whilst also having the novelty to question, sorry, having the independence to question novelty for novelty's sake. We do not have to be modish here, but we are diverse and increasingly so. We do not have to reject what's old simply because it's old. Now, to give you one example of that slightly obscure statement, the work that I've been doing on St. Stephen's Chapel in the Palace of Westminster, and that Murray Tremellan here in the front row and Kirsty Wright, who can't be with us today, have been carrying forward, that work can be traced back to the work of intrepid antiquaries in the 1790s, um, who were practically fighting their way into the Palace of Westminster to crawl behind wooden paneling to record medieval wall paintings um, before they were um, torn apart um, by the reforming architect, uh, James Wyatt, um, and then destroyed in the great fire of the Palace of Westminster in 1834. I really feel that sense of deep descent from the past, from those antiquaries of the 1790s. And the work that Murray and I are doing is absolutely dependent um, on, those, on that uh, strong bedrock of antiquarian scholarship of the past. Now for this early career conference, the um, organizers um, here on the front row, Laura Jen and Murray have chosen the theme of the experience of politics and political culture. When I was studying for my doctorate, I wasn't terribly sure what political culture meant. In fact, I barely heard the phrase until the late Kevin Sharp introduced me to someone else at a dinner. This is John Cooper. He works on Tudor political culture. I thought, do I? Maybe I do. That sounds quite classy. Um, and I stole that description and I've used it um, ever since. I work on Tudor political culture. And so I used it as the subtitle for my first book, but it was sort of attributed to me before I really understood um, what it means. So what does political culture mean? Well, today, collectively, you are going to help to define that, I think. You could find definitions in works of political science, for sure, the term comes in from political science. Maybe you could find definitions in history books, or at least, since historians are often rather shy of defining these things, you will find competing understandings in the history books that you're reading about what political culture means. But to hazard my own definition, which I confess was completed on the number 38 from the Essex Road this morning, perhaps the very last time I complete my prep on the bus on the way to school, I would say that for British historians at least, political culture is a term that, one, has extended conventional definitions of high or parliamentary or court politics to constituencies classically outside the sphere of formal governance. The common people, whatever we call those in the early modern period, women, excluded communities of all kinds, Catholics, Jews, people of color. Historians have done very valuable work in recovering the political culture of those groups. Secondly, Political culture has decentered politics to encompass the regional and the local, both in their own right, because they're important, and for their interactions with the political center. And that's what actually I was doing in my doctorate a very long time ago. I was using the concept of political culture to explore the far west of England, Cornwall and Devon, in terms of its institutions, for sure, but also its society and its architecture and its material culture and its identities. That's what I was attempting to do in my doctorate. Now, looking at the whole of the British Isles, the relationship between England and Ireland seems particularly open to this kind of political cultural approach to bring together the sometimes overtly national and at their edges, even nationalistic historiographies of those two territories. 
So it's particularly welcome that what we're doing today is incorporating Ireland and England into the same conversation. And I heard very similar things being said um, at a recent um, online conference of um, Irish scholars of the same uh, chronology as we're looking at today. Thirdly, and finally, this concept of political culture has broadened the source materials and the research questions and the disciplinary approaches of political history to incorporate representations of power in art, architecture, and material culture. Now that's the kind of political culture that the historian Kevin Sharp did so much to open up um, for my period of early modern England um, and attributed to me rather prematurely at this dinner that we were at. Now this strand of political culture has involved a dialogue between history and adjacent disciplines. I call it a dialogue, actually at times I think it's more of a raiding party conducted by historians on other disciplines. But those disciplines clearly include um, English literature. So one of our speakers um, today, Jonathan McGovern, um, who is beaming in from Nanjing, um, actually, um, although in some senses as much of a Tudor historian as I am, actually studied for his doctorate within an English literature department and uh, uses literary sources um, as his starting point. Um, history of art, of course, more than one of you um, are historians of art. Um, also anthropology, the whole um, approach to, um, to ritual and to liturgy and to performance within some of the spaces um, that, uh, for instance, royal palaces. But again, this is a very much a, a, an emerging um, agenda. So political culture takes in a swathe of activity that historians might once have blanched at, actually, from dress. Dress in the deep historical past at one stage, not so long ago, 20, 30 years ago, would have been something that only historians on the margins would have been interested in. Now, thanks to the work of people um, in this room and online, and also the work of um, our fellow Maria Haywood, questions of dress and performance and ritual at the Royal Court of Henry VIII are absolutely paramount. Um, and it's been taken in new directions as well um, to other aspects um, of court culture, um, gesture, dancing, those sort of social rituals that we are now recovering and learning so much more about. That is far from a comprehensive definition of political culture, but hopefully it gives you something at least to work with. I suspect that by the end of today, you will come up, be able to come up with a rather better explanation of what political culture might be uh, between our chosen chronology of really the, the high medieval England um, and the early 19th century. But just to recap, in a very, um, you know, lecturing my second years at the University of York sort of way, political culture has extended, it has decentered, and it has broadened our definitions of history. You are all most welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, and I'm now going to uh, hand over to Jane Caddick. <laughs>